Hello, and welcome to today's webinar entitled, Strengthen the Security of Your IAM System, Radiant One's Advanced Security Features. My name is Emily Cashel. I'm with Radiant Logic, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that your lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar. However, if you have a question, you may enter it into the GoToWebinar window, and we will have a Q&A session at the end, if time allows. If we are not able to get to your question during the webcast, we'll send a personal email to follow up. Also, this webcast will be recorded and sent out along with a copy of the presentation slide within the next few hours. Our speaker today will be Wade Ellery, Senior Solutions Architect with Radiant Logic. Wade has extensive experience in enterprise IT direct and channel software and services, sales, and management. He has in-depth knowledge and experience in enterprise IAM, IAG, risk and compliance, and IT security challenges. Wade, over to you. Thank you very much, Emily, and welcome, everyone. Today we'll be talking about Inside Radiant One 7.2, an expose on advanced security features within our product set. I want to take a few minutes today to sort of set the stage before we get into some details of the product, but we are going to look very deeply into the solution and give you some insights into how we've incorporated some advanced security features that allow you to provide a, a richer and more secure environment for your identities and for your organization. What's really been driving uh, the industry in the last 10 years has been a, a shift in the way we actually interact with our users, with our identities, with our applications, with our devices. Initially, we lived in this little world inside that blue box there where everything was behind a firewall, everybody worked inside the same building, everybody were, was employees. So we had this level of control because we knew exactly where the perimeter was and we knew how to exercise control over the different pieces of the identity space. But really, that's exploded in the last uh, 10 years and even more so in the last five years with the advent of the cloud. Uh, the organizations that we used to control now are no longer just employees, but it's contractors. But we're also expected now to support customers and partners and members and people who don't have a, a contractual relationship with us but actually consume our products. And it requires us to relate to those users in a much different way with a much different set of controls and, and interactions. At the same time, if you look at the vertical axis going up, the applications that we're supporting, the ways we interact with those customers, is, is gone in many different directions from just on-premise applications that we owned and controlled to now applications coming from partners, applications coming from cloud or SaaS providers, application platforms that we actually have no direct interaction with. We have a set of rules that we have to adhere to or APIs that we can talk with, but we don't have any direct management over those applications and the way they operate. So again, that level of, of control and management has gone out of our hands and into those of others. And then the devices themselves, we used to have computers that sat on the desktop. We could wipe their image every night. We ran our own virus scanning. Everything was locked down. All the ports were closed. Everything was good and tight. But now we have people running around with jailbroken iPads sitting in Starbucks on an unconnected or unsecured uh, Wi-Fi connection potentially accessing those SaaS applications using their customer identity through my identity store. So this can be a real challenge for your IT department to say, how do I still deliver security in this model? What do I have left that I can control? And really, the only thing that's common here in all three of these areas that you can still actually exercise control around is identity. Identity has become the new perimeter. Where it was the firewall, it was the physical building, now it's actually your identity. Wherever it goes, if I know enough about it, if I have enough contextual information about your identity and I have enough policies and rules in place, I can still secure that interaction. I can make sure that access to applications is secure, the right person is getting the right access at the right time, and I can prevent bad operators from getting access to my system and potentially hijacking a whole season of a popular online TV show or something else negative that might happen if I lose control of my uh, environment. But there's a challenge to, to managing that identity because as, as you look at that sphere and those three uh, that cube and those three axes have exploded in directions, we also have an inherent challenge that's really been with us since the beginning. 
And that's that identity itself, as it has is built up in our legacy platforms, is a very disconnected, a very scattered uh, set of information. That the information I use for accessing a particular application may all be in one AD domain, but another application may use a completely different set of identity information in an LDAP directory, and another application may pull everything from my HR database that it uses to authenticate my users, or an SAP roles database. So I have a real challenge in not only where my identity information is stored, but then if you look at the map in front of you, the crisscross lines here, I end up with dependencies where identity information actually comes from multiple different sources it has to be aggregated together and correlated in a way that can be accessed by the application that can be leveraged internally. Uh, we have a customer that uses a, uh, an SAP portal to provide access to their resources for people external to their network, but the challenge with that is, is the SAP portal is being hosted on a platform that wants to use LDAP, INET uh, org person is the schema, and the backend identity information is stored in AD, which is actually a different user schema, and then the role information controlling access to that portal is actually in an SAP database. So how do you bring together all these different constituencies and make a seamless interaction for the user? You really need to be able to bring a layer into this challenge where you can correlate, aggregate, normalize the information, transform it, and translate it, and then make it available to the applications in exactly the format the schema, the structure, and in the protocol that they need to consume. And I'll use those words over and over again. Let me take a moment just to sort of define them a little bit. Schema is, is really the language that the application talks. It's the vocabulary that the application uses. And we have a challenge within our own industry of just things like acronyms. I can use uh, MDM to mean mobile device management to someone who's in the mobile space. But I can also use MDM to mean master data management for someone who's in the identity or the data warehousing environment. So even the same acronym can have completely different uses. Well, inside a schema, you have a set of, of terms or attributes that identify users. One attribute may be user ID, UID, that may represent a user. But in an AD, it may be SAM account name that represents a user or it may be user principal name in another application. So it's very important that that language be understood both by the store for that information, the source of that identity information has to properly label those attributes and provide the right data in those attributes. But then when they're presented to the application, they have to be translated and transformed potentially into a different language and a different vocabulary that can be consumed by that application because it may be speaking German and the back end may be speaking French and they can't get along together unless you can translate that. And that's something that Radiant Logic can do for you. There's also the requirement for correlation. If you look at all the lines coming from the sources of identity at the bottom of the page here, they're coming into Radiant One, I'm potentially combining identities from multiple sources. I need to be able to understand what rules do I apply? How do I correlate? How do I match? Joe Smith in one system and Jay Smith in another system and Smith 121 in a third system that happen to be the same person, how do I bring those records together into one global profile that I can then present to my applications as a single view? And again, this is the power of the Radiant Logic platform is to provide this level of, of aggregation, of schema transformation. And then structure can be very important. A lot of my backends may have legacy structures that they need to maintain, that certain applications are expecting information to be organized regionally and then functionally and then by department. So I have to keep that structure. But I may need those same identities from that source to be shown as a single flat list for a SAML or SAS-based application that only understands a flat single level and doesn't understand organizational structure. So I need to be able to reorganize this information on the fly without destroying the original set itself. I can't ask the owners of this identity information to change for my needs. I need to be able to provide that metamorphosis and represent that information to those applications as they need to see it. 
And the challenge on the top side is that each application potentially wants to see the information in a different way. I may need, have applications that want to see the AD user schema, and another application that wants to see the INET org person schema, and another application that has an extended attribute set that came from a customer database that doesn't have a schema at all. And I have to be able to simultaneously present that information in those different formats, in those different vocabularies so they can be consumed, and again, in the protocol that the application needs. So I have databases that use JDBC. I have directories like AD and LDAP that use LDAP. I have applications that use web services. I have REST interfaces. I have SKIM. I have all these different protocols that are used to transport and, and deliver the information. And I may need to translate between protocols because my source and my target may not, again, use the same protocol. They may not use the same way of transferring information across the wire. So all this has to happen in that little bubble there in the middle. And you're probably thinking to yourself, that's a lot to bite off. How do you do all that work? How do you make that magic happen? Well, that is the result of 15 years of product development. This is not a new solution. This is the platform that we've been building with the feedback from our customers for 15 years. We have seen the challenges that you're experiencing today. We work through with our customers the problems of aggregating and correlating multiple identities and multiple sources. We've understood and worked with different schemas. We've incorporated protocols as they're added to the standards-based environment. We brought REST in far ahead of when our customers were using REST themselves. So we've worked diligently to build this very powerful logic engine. That's the blue sphere you see there. And then on top of that, to optimize this model, we've included in HDAP Store our highly available LDAP v3 compliant directory store that lets you store information at our level in our highly available uh, clustered environment so you can optimize performance both from aggregations and, and calculations that have been done to build a global profile and that can be stored locally and then made available at the speed of a directory. We can also be a replacement for legacy directories, old Sun One infrastructures that are being that are being sunset because they're no longer supported. That information can be migrated into Radiant One. And the complexity of that backend environment can be greatly simplified because I can represent the identity information in one store in many different ways where traditionally I had to stand up a different LDAP store a different AD for each of the different models that I had to present, I can have one source of truth and then represent that multiple different ways. And I can also store information from database backends. I can take a local copy of that, watch the database for changes to make sure that any updates are immediately reflected at our level, but I can insulate the applications from databases being down for backup or maintenance or, or the slow nature of databases to do joins and be able to provide information. If you remember the rollout of, of healthcare.gov, and this, again, now turns out to be seven years ago. I'm going to date myself on this one. Uh, that platform was a, uh, a linking of a lot of databases in real time, and the, the slow slowness and performance there and the overhead and the challenge there, a lot of that came from the fact that the data was never optimized for performance to be able to deliver it. And this is something the Radiant Logic level can do for you, our layer of abstraction. If you see it in this diagram, we're the source of information correlated from all your back ends that then supports all the applications that need identity information. And I'll say is just a sort of a slight tension here. Don't think of it as just identity information. As far as Radiant Logic is concerned, I, data is data. It can be attributes about a user. It can be attributes about a locomotive. It can be attributes about a jet engine. It can be attributes about a router. It can be anything that you want to store information about that relates back to an, to an object that we can identify, a schema that we can create, and then <clears throat> a context in how you relate all this together so you can build relationships between a doctor and a patient and, an app and a prescription and a pharmacy and an insurance company and bring all that information together and get much more value out of it. And then provide that data to all the consuming applications, whether they be on the left-hand column there in yellow there, the, the provisioning, self-service, password management, user registration applications, 
the middle column there, the access management, the web access management solutions, the CA single sign-on, the, the cloud identity applications, the cloud uh, <clears throat> single sign-on applications, anything that's providing access to a user, user portals, and then the whole area of audit and role and compliance of understanding who has access to what, why do they have it, do they still need it, can I attest to that, can I give it to my auditors, all that is fed by a foundational layer of identity information coming from Radiant Logic sourced by what you already have in your environment without asking your identity owners to change what they do, without asking anyone to collapse an AD infrastructure or to clean up data because you have the state attribute filled in with two capital letters in some places and spelled out Wisconsin in another place and WIS period in another place and no filtering or, or reporting tool can easily manage all that variation, we'll clean that up for you at our layer. We'll do all the washing and the scrubbing so you get a pristine image of your identity information correlated and translated for all of your applications. Now, <clears throat> there are some considerations here then when you start talking about identity information and the, the key focus of today's presentation is security. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that when you are uh, talking to a source of identity information, that's coming across a network connection. It may be a wired connection. It may be fiber optic. It may be between data centers and an AWS infrastructure. It may be Wi-Fi across the office. But in some way, that data is crossing um, a, a connection from the source to Radiant Logic. And then the applications that are querying Radiant Logic to get that information to do authentications, authorizations, lookups, reporting, queries, all the things you do to consume that information, they're also getting that information over some sort of connection. So as the information travels on those connections, you need to make sure that information is secure. You need to be able to make sure that you are applying standard protocols for transforming that information into an encrypted model and that information is uh, encrypted before it leaves and is not allowed to travel on the wire in any clear form. This is critical especially when you're moving authentication authorization <clears throat> and you have uh, passwords traveling across the, the wire. So right inside the Radiant Logic setup you have, you can see there on the right hand side sort of misty covered in blue, um, being able to designate SSL over a particular port. Uh, 636 is the standard SSL port we support, but if you want to remap to an alternative port for SSL, we can do that. And this is a back-end by back-end connection platform. So you have the ability here to uh, set up SSL and those connections to each of the sources of identity. But also on the front end, we have the ability to set up SSL so that the incoming application, or TLS, however, whatever protocol you want to use, and we've eliminated the ones that have been cracked. We have full support for the suite of, uh, of over-the-wire encryption protocols. So you have a way to, to satisfy that. <clears throat> and you can manage the clusters, uh, or excuse me, the certificates internally. Uh, you can use certificate uh, management tools, uh, trusted certificate authorities, all of that supported. We like to say we're platform agnostic and we're standards-based. We're going to always default back to the standard. So if there's a standard way that everyone works with, with over-the-wire encryption, we're going to incorporate that in our model. We're going to be able to play well with others and work well with other tools. <clears throat> now that we've encrypted the data coming from the source to us and from us out to the consuming applications, the next question is, well, what about the data that's stored in the HDAP store? What if my request is not just a proxy through to the back end and I'm not actually storing the data, but every query that comes to Radiant Logic is forwarded to the back end and the information that's collected is forwarded to the application. What about a scenario where I've stored information locally? I may have created a complex a union of five sources of identity from a domino directory to active directory to an LDAP and a database and I need to bring all that data together in one global profile and make it available very quickly. You don't want to wait during an authentication or authorization call to rebuild that relationship on the fly. You can, but there's some overhead in that. So you want to pre-calculate that result and then store that. Always watching the back end for updates 
So if something changes on one of the sources, we reflect that in our stored version immediately. <clears throat> but I have that stored version now available at the speed of a directory. Or as mentioned before, I may be an actual directory store. I may be a place where you provision directly into the application. We have customers doing this on premise up in AWS where Radiant Logic's HSAP store is the primary identity store, it's the information store. Or I may be hosting that information or caching it for a performance need in say a backend database. In all those scenarios, I have data stored at the HSAP layer. We allow you now to encrypt that information at rest. So that information is going to be encrypted um, in the back end uh, as it's stored. You have a whole library of encryption keys and ciphers that you can select. So you can pick the one that matches your level of requirements within your organization. You can even incorporate the enhanced level of encryption. There's a plugin available for the, from the Java standards out of Oracle that allows you to use an even higher level of encryption so we can get very high up in the uh, encryption model. And <clears throat> anything that you do in the HSAP store, whether it's HSAP stores files, files stored locally, any backups of those files, any exports of those HSAP uh, stores from an, as an LDIF file are going to be encrypted. So we're not going to let the, the information be stored or leave the uh, Radiant Logic platform, if it's been designated as encrypted information, it will remain encrypted uh, in all those formats. Also, if you are connecting to the application, um, to Radiant Logic from an application, we're going to require that that application have a connect or have an encrypted SSL TLS connection before we release that information out to the application. So you may have encrypted data. <clears throat> where you're storing social security number, it's in a view, it's available for a query. The application that's querying it has not been set up with SSL, so it would pull that information across an open wire. We will not decrypt and let that information leave Radiant One until we get an encrypted connection. So we understand not only the nature of encrypting its store, but all the places that information goes, it needs to be encrypted, it needs to travel on that wire. So I've been talking a lot about functionality now. Let me give you a little bit of, of architecture just so you have an understanding of the, the two major components of our solution, how these work together. And the, the factors that we'll be talking today about security really live in, in both contexts. The integration layer, this is the layer where we perform all the magic, where we transform and translate protocols and schemas, where we set up encryption uh, keys where we set up SSL connections, all the logic is done in this very powerful logic engine that allows us to manage these identities both as a proxy but also as a store and be able to have that identity information available at the speed of the directory. Now this includes both user objects and group objects and potentially device objects. So anything that we can bring in the platform, again, is standards-based and, and platform agnostic, so it doesn't really necessarily uh, care uh, about what the information is as long as the information follows a protocol, follows a standard. Now, if you've extended your schema, if you've added a bunch of additional attributes from an application that needs additional data, you added attributes in because you had internal requirements or you just felt like doing it one weekend for fun, we can extend our schema within Radiant Logic also we can actually import your extended schema. We can use schema extensions and, and marry those back to the primary schema. We can build as, as complex and as, and as customizable and extensible a schema as you need. And we can even extend the schema just at the Radiant Logic level to store additional attributes there. And that brings into, into view the storage component too. The HDAP store was designed to be highly scalable, highly effective platform. Together, these two pieces provide a complete solution that handles all the logic, all the management, and then the optimization of the information, both when it's a persistent cache of, of a complex join or data from a back end that may not be highly available, or it's an actual acting as a directory and simultaneously providing that information uh, to the back end. So you've got a tremendous leverage here of both components working together. And this provides you with a level of functionality that you cannot find in any other solution. There is no traditional LDAP directory out there from any of the big stack vendors that provides this layer 
of logic and, and power to correlate, manipulate, uh, and translate and transform. And then in, in any of the simpler uh, proxy solutions that, that are available for proxying information in a directory, you're not going to have the ability to store and, and cache that information and optimize it for performance, and especially at scale. We built the HDAP store, uh, and you'll see a little bit later, I think, some uh, around technology based on the Apache Hadoop big data model using Zookeeper and Lucene to optimize the cluster for performance, to eliminate LDAP replication challenges, uh, both between uh, nodes and when you're indexing the, the challenge, the ability for the system to support large numbers of users with large amounts of throughput. So it's a very uh, optimized platform as an LDAP v3 server. It's designed, again, to be highly available, highly scalable. It supports very complex queries around tens or hundreds of millions of users. And this was required because our traditional LDAP directories that we were trying to leverage wouldn't support the environments that our customers are moving into. More and more of our customers are going beyond just the on-premise uh, employee-based 50,000, 100,000 users, even our customers as large as 350,000 employees and contractors are moving into the customer side of their world. They're talking to their own customers using Radiant Logic, And you quickly get into the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of customers. That information needs to be available in a very fast, a very highly available, very mission critical application. And that's where the HDAP store came into play. And we've optimized that now for, for storing and searching identity information and publishing contextual views of that data that can be consumed uh, in ways that are optimizing that kind of data information, giving you the ability to uh, interact with your customers and, and your customer relationship in that Amazon look and feel that I know a lot about you. I have it in a context. I know what you've done with this from all these different backend platforms. I've correlated that and built this global view of my customer that I can now act on and I can use to enhance their experience. That's becoming more and more critical within our own customers' uh, solutions. Also in the identity or the uh, security space, and this has been really in the headlines now for a couple of years, and this is becoming more and more of a focus for organizations as they understand that security is important. Like anything, like a bank, you secure uh, the tellers behind you know, screens and behind glass and the cash drawers are, are locked and that stuff is secure. But where you put the tens of thousands of dollars or the gold bars or the uh, masterpiece paintings is inside the vault. You have to be able to understand that there's a level of of risk associated with, with the value of an asset. And that's true in the identity space. A regular user account has the ability to do things within the user's applications and, and operate within the user's context. But if you look at an administrative account, you look at an admin account, the, the God writes on the network, as we say, that account has the ability to do virtually anything given the right scope. It can not only control a user's access and applications, and, and it can act on behalf of a user, or it can access uh, systems at a level that a YAML user couldn't get into, or it can create shadow accounts that it hides somewhere in the network to be used later. So compromising a privileged account is really a catastrophic failure within the security model, and there's a lot of work being done now around privileged account or privileged identity access management, being able to control who has access to privileged accounts and make sure that the security around those for authentication and authorization of those accounts is, is escalated to a, a higher level, is much more accountable, is much more governed so that you have control over that. CyberArk is a major player in that space and we've integrated our platform with CyberArk because when you're talking about identity information, the Radiant Logic platform needs to be able to access the identity information on many different backend databases, directories, Active Directory, and we traditionally do that with an account that has elevated privileges. Now you can give a delegated level of privileges to just the minimum that Radiant Logic needs, but if we're resetting passwords, if we're generating accounts on the backend, 
if we're reading this information, we're going to have a certain level of, of access that you want to make sure is secure. So if you're operating with CyberArk in your environment, you can use the CyberArk's vault as a method for securing the credentials that we use, and we can pass that all through our platform. So you really can lock down not only your, your uh, personal administrative accounts that people are interacting with, but also the service accounts and even down to the service accounts that Radiant Logic is using. Because again, we understand the concept of security is, is not an island. It is a infrastructure. It's a fabric. And, and the weakest chain in the link is going to be the part that's compromised. So we built the product here now to, to leverage and manage <clears throat> and interact with as many security layers for on-disk encryption, for on-the-wire encryption, for secure connections, for privileged account uh, access enhancements, all those factors have been included <clears throat> to make sure that the uh, platform itself is secure and it can be a place where you can trust that although we're working with your identity information, we're not a vulnerability in your environment. You've got excellent audit and reporting uh, capability and you have all the tools in place that are available in the market space. But now that, that idea of security can be expended, extended beyond just the, just the radiologic layer because security, again, is this fabric that, that encompasses everything in your organization. And the application security is, is more and more critical. And if you look at the concept of, of a compromise of an of a account, the challenge being that traditionally and, and this is probably going to be the case for quite a while, we've relied on user IDs and passwords as the method for authenticating users. And although in every conference that I've been to in the last 10 years, there's been at least one panel that declared passwords were dead, we're moving off passwords, we've got the whole process figured out, and we're just going to get rid of them and do something better, passwords are still there, passwords are still what gets compromised, uh, it's the way most accounts are, are taken out, and that's why CyberArk really focuses on securing those passwords. But there is another layer of, of authentication validation that can be added to your applications, and that's two-factor authentication. That's using not only something you know, a password, but something you have, an RSA token, a soft token on your mobile device, a Ubico a uh, USB key that plugs into your hardware device, something that you physically have to have, and something you know in combination. So that a bad actor in another nation across the globe who may have information about you can't necessarily compromise your account because they don't have the physical component they need to interact with the system. But the challenge has always been, that's great, but it's cumbersome, it's difficult for users to use. My applications don't have any hooks into utilizing it. I can't operate with that. I've got hundreds of legacy LDAP applications that have no way of leveraging two-factor authentication. So what am I going to do? How am I going to make that work? Radiant Logic to the rescue. And this actually came, again, as I mentioned, this, is a, this product is 15 years of product development with millions of interactions with our customers and direct feedback from those customers on what they need, what works, what would be better, how they need to, to use the product in the real world. And one of the things that came back from our customers was integrating two-factor authentication into our authentication flow seamlessly with the end user. And this is really a, a, a marvelous use of the Radiant Logic technology. We are in the flow between the application and the back-end source. We are that abstraction layer. So if we're the abstraction layer, let's go ahead and configure Radiant Logic now to intercept the authentication request and manipulate that authentication request in a way that we can both authenticate the user against Active Directory, which would be the normal path for that, but we can also ask the user at the time of the authentication to go ahead and append their AD password or their LDAP password, their database password, whatever password they're using, with the token code that comes from their mobile soft token, their RSA fob, or automatically from their Ubico key, append that on the end of your password in the same field that you enter your password in every day, 
no change to the application, we will take that information, parse those two pieces, we will send the authentication for uh, the directory back to Active Directory to authenticate, and we'll send the token over to the RSA Secure ID server to authenticate the back end. So here you can see the simple screens for basically identifying the RSA Secure ID server and being able to communicate with that server so we have an account that will uh, be honored by the RSA server and recognize that Radiant Logic is making a REST service request to say, please validate this token. And then down below, you've got the custom authenticated provider that allows us to go ahead and designate uh, the password extraction rules so we know how to parse the password, um, what part of the token we're going to take with us, uh, what we're going to use, and how we're going to map that user ID that we're getting in. Jay Smith was his login credentials, but he's not known in RSA Secure ID Server as Jay Smith. So we've mapped that internally by uh, correlating to the ID uh, database inside RSA. So we can send over the right identifier when we send over the, uh, the PIN to be validated. And then once that validation comes back, if both of those are positive, we're going to go ahead and send on a bind request or a bind uh, order back to the application to say, you're authenticated and the user's on his way. This just gives you a quick look at the, uh, the jar file that's generated by configuring the different parameters. And then once that's done, you'll go ahead and uh, load up that jar file, restart the uh, Radiologic server once because you're reloading a Java uh, application layer, and we'll now have support for RSA Secure ID. Now, if the view that's been created has not been set up for RSA Secure ID, then the user will be able to go ahead and authenticate against that particular view with just a regular username and password, and the binds will take place and everything will work fine. But if you have configured that particular view, and the view is the way an application accesses Radiant Logic. As I mentioned before, we can support many applications seeing information in many different ways, including many applications using many different authentication methods. So if you want two-factor authentication, you create a view that has the authentication sources that you want. You configure it to support two-factor authentication. And then for anyone that is going to that application that's pointing back to that particular view in Radiant Logic, they will be able to input their user ID, their token, and that information will be parsed out, sent to the proper back end, and once everything has been validated, they'll get a successful connection to that application. Again, nothing has to change at the application layer. You don't alter the application at all. And this works not only for RSA Secure ID tokens, but it also works for PIV and, and CAC cards. So if you've got physical identity cards that are being swiped to get in the door and are being used to leverage um, authenticating the users, you've got card readers on laptops or on desktops, that authentication can also be married with the LDAP authentication, and that can be run through the system. So you've got a very powerful platform here for interacting that way. Now, if you're using Ubico keys, which is a physical token, it's a USB token that, that slips into your uh, machine, it may be your laptop, it may be your desktop, um, that device generates its own a uh, highly encrypted uh, key, 44 characters long, the first 12 being the identifier, and that interacts with another uh, back-end uh, Ubico Cloud URL to authenticate the user. So this gives you a mobile version of this platform that you can use very easily. Um, it can be a personal authentication piece, or it can be um, a corporate uh, standard that you, that you adopt. And again, the same scenario here, you set up the connection to YubicoKey Cloud, we're using their API uh, to, to connect to the cloud, and then you set up the filter, you go ahead and load up the Java program, compile that, load it up, and now when you've got your little YubicoKey, and you can see it in the picture there at the bottom, plugged into your USB port, you simply tap the key to say, hey, uh, generate a password, password's generated, Radiant Logic validates the back end against AD, uh, and then they get the bind and you're on your way. So it's very easy, very simple to integrate this particular system into the platform. And again, I mentioned RSA and I've mentioned Ubico, but it's any two-factor authentication application that has a standard protocol that we can communicate with. And they're all built around the standard because they're, they're designed to use uh, secure ID 
and, and interact with with the applications that are understanding that platform. So if you've got Duo or any other two-factor product, that was going to work the same way, and we've got the templates for those ready to go. So this is a way to actually enhance security in your environment with two-factor without any application integration, without any change, and very minimal uh, requirements for the end user. A lot of times the challenge to two-factor authentication is that I've got to go to another screen, I've got to go through another set of mouse clicks, I have to do all this extra work. Just simply append the PIN code at the end of your password, hit the regular enter button, and you're on your way. So we, the FID enables multi-factor authentication via LDAP login, um, and we, we can do this also uh, when we're aggregating multiple AD domains and storing computed attributes. So we have a method within the CyberArk model now for uh, uh, allowing CyberArk to uh, manage identities through the FID interface. And we can also set up uh, both a push method and a pull method in terms of uh, CyberArk uh, managing the credentials. CyberArk can push the credentials into Radiant 1. So if there's an update to credentials and CyberArk is managing credentials globally, and, they, and an admin identity account has been updated, password has been changed, service account's been managed by CyberArk, they can push that update right into to Radiant Logic. We can also do a pool where Radiant Logic leaves the, uh, the information in CyberArk, and, and then when that credentials are needed, we can go to the credential vault, get that information, pull it back, and, and then store uh, the connection string uh, to the system. So this allows us to set up um, CyberArk in a couple of different ways depending on the way that your organization wants to operate and how you want that information uh, taken in and stored. And then there's simple configuration options within the setup to uh, designate that we are pushing or pulling that data so that the proper credentials within our uh, connection strings are set properly. And um, if you've got a, a scenario where there are credentials, say, for a SQL backend database that has been uh, managed by CyberArk, and Radiant Logic is going to access that SQL database to get information, uh, customer records, authentication authorization. You've got an update coming from uh, CyberArk for the database. That then will, can be pushed directly from CyberArk back into Radiant 1. So you don't have to worry about um, us keeping up with what the flow is in the back end. You don't have to worry about us being able to track the information. Um, that's all can be managed by the configuration so that when uh, CyberArk is uh, resyncing or uh, modulating uh, identity information within the organization or updating credentials, that information can be incorporated in Radiant Logic. And the pull method, very similarly, um, that Credential updates go back into CyberArk, uh, and we have CyberArk now as a source for those credentials, so Radiant Logic can be instructed to make a call to that back end, and when those credentials are updated, pull that new updated information into Radiant Logic. This is using the, uh, the API uh, component, the CyberArk AIM component, so you need to have that component in your environment available for us to incorporate. That's what gives us the pool capability. Uh, but again, the key here is to understand that uh, however your environment is leveraging CyberArk, we've worked closely with them. They, like us, are standards-based. We're using all the standard protocols. We're using the CyberArk APIs. We're allowing the uh, method that you prefer to be incorporated in the system. So just sort of recapping what we talked about today, we've got encryption with all of our connections from applications to uh, Backend sources, we've got the ability to store the information in encrypted format on a field-by-field -field basis, or you encrypt all the information at rest. We can leverage CyberArk for credential, privilege credential and service credential management and a push and a pull model. And we can give you the access to two-factor authentication in your LDAP applications tomorrow. Literally with simple configuration uh, changes, you can have that capability available to your users, whether they're mobile, uh, with mobile device and soft tokens that are using a FOB, however they're operating with your platform, we'll be able to add that information into it. 
So I want to take the, the last part of our, our little time frame here and sort of talk about our administrative interface and, and a couple of things we've done that are both administrative and security enhancements that we've added to Radiant Logic here. And we've done this with the, the advent of the 7.2.0 uh, interface, or 7.2.0. Uh, X interface. We've gone to an HTML, HTML5 uh, GUI interface here that gives us a lot more flexibility, gives us a chance to redesign and, and reincorporate uh, some functionality into our product. And I want to sort of touch on those features. If you're familiar with Radiant Logic, um, then you're going to be familiar with a lot of what we've done here um, and how that works. We have now the, uh, the ability to log to database uh, capabilities, so you can configure the database that you want all the logs sent to. Uh, this helps in, in sizing. Um, you may have a, uh, a much larger database uh, store available, so you don't have to worry about uh, having logs files turned up and a lot of logging information filling up the local store and the Radiant Logics disk space. Also, dumping it into a database now gives you the ability to run a lot of additional query information against that log information and very, very simple, easy to configure that information to be stored out to a database. And we have a lot of information in the reports. There's, there's access information, so all the binds, the search requests, the single level subtree searches, adds, modifies, deletes, anything that flows through Radiant Logic is audited and logged so you can bring that information into your store. Uh, very specific operations. Even if you turn up logging to the fourth level for debugging, you can see the actual XML uh, files that are moving through the system to do some very granular analysis of what's going on. And then auditing, uh, summary of all types of operations. Um, we've also got sections detailing information such as users to end, the perform operations, uh, operations performed by user, total number of times a particular operation was performed. So you've got some audit and statistical information that's correlated and provided in the reporting tools that are available to you now. Um, improved monitoring now and logging. Uh, more consistent logging formats now. We use log for j So as we'll see in a minute, you can actually set up logs in many different formats. Uh, we're monitoring more information now, support, CPUs, disk usage, memory, connectivity nodes. So the servers themselves have a lot more alerting and, and monitoring built into them to let you know what's going on with the system. Um, and then we have easier monitoring. We have uh, HTTPS HDAP uh, store statistics. You can see the amount of reads and writes and, and capacity of your HDAP store because now we are a physical local store. You can see disk latency, which is critical uh, with the cluster uptime and, and seeing where issues are within the system. And then alerts can be configured around all of these particular functions. We've also simplified the log files. If you worked with us before, you may have known there's a, there's a number of different log files out there. You had to go correlating and searching, and we had to kind of put them together and work across logs. We've now put these all together into a service log and an access log. So it's much simpler, easier to manage, much easier to take care of. And if you've got reporting requirements and you want to bring those log files into other applications, we've incorporated log appenders. Um, those allow you to take our log files and append them into other systems like syslog. So you can translate and directly push that information into syslog or a number of other uh, applications or log formats that are supported by log4j. And there are templates and, and uh, maps that can be configured to bring those log files in. So this helps a lot in considering this information. Um, and this gives you a list of sort of the appenders that are available, SMTP, JDBC Appender, Flume. Um, really covers a wide range of options here in the way your log files are, are taken into your organization. And the intention here is because, again, we're, we're focusing around security. We're focusing around the value of this information. It is important to know who's doing what, where, when they're doing it. Um, you've got more and more uh, wide-ranging and very granular uh, management consoles available now to parse through logs, to, to build alerts, to build contextual uh, awareness. And being able to incorporate the information flowing through Radiant Logic into that environment is, is only a benefit. Um, also, too, there's improved uh, control panel usage here. The top one, you can see this would be an environment with three clusters up. So you have one place to go to see where all three of my servers are in that cluster. 
how am I doing on CPU utilization? This is how much churning I'm doing to process requests and to build the views and to calculate attributes. Um, how much memory am I using? How many uh, objects am I holding in memory? How much am I doing in terms of syncing? How much am I um, consuming? And then how much disk space do I have? Am I, are my logs building up? Do I need to go out to an external SQL? Am I, am I consuming or storing a lot of information, my HDAP on a very high level? And then at each individual server, I can drill down and get in much more granular statistical information about trends and monitoring here, just like you would with Task Manager on a server. You can do Task Manager basically on Radiant Logic also. And then I have the ability to set up alerts, so I can set up um, automatic email and, and uh, uh, task uh, alerts. Um, I have a very powerful main control panel there for, for seeing things in a very graphical model, but also in managing and starting and restarting systems. Um, we have a new location for the version number because now we're on multiple servers in a cluster. You can potentially be running on different versions, especially during an upgrade process where you're doing each one at a time. So on each server under user and activities where you find the VDS build down to the build number. Um, and then we've moved the directory namespace tab. Uh, it's now up in the uh, main console, much easier to get to, one less layer of mouse clicking. Um, again, it's all HTML5, so you don't need to load Flash in your browser anymore. You can run it off of Unix platforms much more easily. We've incorporated the directory tree wizard into our wizard format, so just gone around and, and really sort of cleaned up things and, and tried to optimize the interface, again, based on feedback from our customers. And we continue to welcome feedback from our customers. If you are joining us at the Cloud Identity Summit uh, this year in Chicago, uh, later in June, we are doing a customer advisory board meeting. It is an excellent time as a customer or as a prospect. Talk to your account executive about being invited. Um, it's a chance to sit in the room and get a view into the future of Radiant Logic from our our CEO, Michelle Prompt, will talk about where we're going with the technology, how we see the great migration to the cloud uh, affecting everyone, and, and how we're helping you in that space. And also for a chance to listen directly to the customers. We've gotten some amazing insights from the customers, not only in Radiant Logic, how they're using the tool features that they want to incorporate. This is where we learned about the two-factor authentication model that one of our customers had, had sort of made up on their own as a model. Uh, that we've actually incorporated in the product now because the value was there and it came from a customer advisory board uh, meeting. And also a chance to hear from them where they see the world going, the, the massive shift to the cloud um, that seems to be ubiquitous now was something that was really surfaced at our customer advisory board meetings uh, quite publicly. So uh, excellent opportunity there to come and share information and learn from us. Summarizing what we've talked about today, and our focus was around security, and, and I hope I was able to convey the concept that we understand that security is paramount. Uh, identity information is critical data. It is the keys to the kingdom. It is what controls access to everything. And so you need, need to make sure that that information is hardened at every point, that encryption is in place, that information isn't sitting around in an easily uh, consumable or compromisable way. You don't want any clear uh, text to be sitting around that has a critical identity information, especially passwords, available. Um, so we encrypt it in, tra in transit, we encrypt it at rest, we encrypt it in storage and backup. All that information can be as tightly controlled as you need it to be. And then the ability to add multi-factor authentication, MFA, uh, is critical because the, the simple username and password, we're, we're going to be using it for decades to come. Like I said, it's, it's been pronounced dead. Um, but I'll remind everybody that uh, for the, the existence of my time in, in this industry in over 30 years, uh, mainframes have been declared dead over and over again. And we're still working with customers every day that have data on mainframes. So passwords will be here for a long time. We need to find a way to easily and quickly incorporate a second layer of authentication on top of passwords that allow users to secure their connections secure their identity for you to make sure the right person is getting access to the right things. And our two-factor authentication integration with your chosen solution for two-factor authentication and your existing LDAP applications without modification is an excellent marriage of that technology. And then PIM and PAM, again, privileged account management. We use privileged accounts to access those resources. We 
we understand the nature of the trust that's being given to us. Again, the encryption of all the transport of that information is critical, but also the ability to store those credentials in a way that is optimized, that is, is, is vaulted and is as secure as any other source of credentials in your environment is very important. You want to be faster than the person you're hiking with when you're chased by the bear. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the person you're with. And that's the model in security. You want to be stronger than the resource next to you. The, uh, the attack is always going to go at the weakest link. So we've endeavored to make sure that we are as tight and as strong as any resource in your environment. We're not the weak link. We're not the honeypot. So we are not going to be the point of penetration. Some other component is going to be uh, much more attractive. And that's where you want to then be able to focus your attention because we've got this covered for you. You implement it properly. You audit it and control it you've got a good secure situation that you can work with going forward. So I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm going to take a look at some questions here real quick just to um, see if I can touch on a few things before we wrap up at the top of the hour. And let me go bring up the questions. This is always on a little window here, so give me a second to try and make it a little bit bigger. Um, uh, also, are these features available in 7214 version? Yes. These features that I've talked about today are all available in the current release of, of Radiant Logic. These are not future features that we're working on. These are actually existing uh, features available in our product. The 7.2, uh, a lot of these features are in even earlier versions of 7.2 than 7214. We do recommend upgrading to the latest version um, if that's appropriate for your environment. If there's particular features that you need, um, we can probably get you uh, an indication on the minimum product uh, version to get those particular features. We've had like the full uh, disk encryption for the HDAP store in for quite a while. Uh, just to confirm, push and pull are two different methods of updating passwords that are on FID and you seek the appropriate component from CyberArk depending on which method you choose. Yes, that's correct. Um, CyberArk uh, traditionally wants you to do a, uh, a pull. It wants you to call uh, for that. Um, and, and that's the method that we primarily incorporated. It takes the least amount of integration. I think I have it correct. It may be the opposite. Um, and then the, the pull method um, allows us to go to CyberArk and, and pull the credentials. Uh, I think actually pull is the easier one, pushes a little bit more configuration. But there are two different models. You wouldn't necessarily do them simultaneously. Um, you, would, you would pick one based on how you've decided to use CyberArk in your environment. Now, the nice thing about Radiant Logic is, is that very little, if anything, you ever do is porting concrete. So you could potentially start out with one model, and if you wanted to set up a different connection and, and change it from pull to push, um, you could do that configuration change in Radiant Logic without much, uh, much change, because we try to insulate things as much as possible from the outside world. Um, could you go back and talk more about the other multi-factor provider options? How would one integrate with a provider like Duo? Can you add any LDAP or Radius MFA provider? Um, yes, from a con consuming standpoint, um, any LDAP application that, that does an LDAP bind that can query Radiant Logic, um, we can then provide that two-factor authentication. Um, and that could even potentially be over a REST interface. Um, where you're passing over uh, a credential string, uh, we can then split that string and we can then send off the components to the appropriate backends, the directory or, or database, and the two-factor authentication tool. Um, each of these two-factor authentication providers has an API. They have a, a method for you sending them a, a string, uh, identifying that string belonging to a particular account, and for them then identifying in their platform at that particular moment for that particular account, that string is an accurate uh, match to the uh, soft token that they've distributed or the token that's rotating on their FOB or um, the Ubico key that generated that particular uh, string. So that as long as we can talk over that API, we can then um, use that integration. All this, again, is invisible to the end user. They don't know what two-factor authentication, well, they know the two-factor authentication you're using because it's supplying them with the PIN code, but uh, they don't necessarily know uh, in the back end that we're splitting that information 
the application has no awareness of what two-factor authentication you're using. It doesn't have to be have support built in for Duo. We'll handle all the heavy lifting on the back end for you. Um, and then I've got, uh, can two-factor authentication work with customers uh, where the users are in a database and not in AD? Uh, and yes, the, that that password authentication can be a validation against any password store. Normally, Active Directory is the common one you think about. I may have users stored in the LDAP directory that I'm authenticating with. I may have customers stored in a database. As long as we have the proper uh, cipher for hashing the uh, password to do a password compare against the stored password in the database, and that's the traditional method for validating a password in a database, that password is hashed in the database, we take the input password from the user, we hash it and compare. To compare matches, they gave us the same password, and we can give back a bind. So we can do a bind against the directory, or we can do a bind against the database, and that can be a part of the two-factor authentication component. So that covers the questions that we had uh, this morning. I do really appreciate everyone's attention uh, today. We will be talking again uh, in two weeks uh, on another uh, Radiant Logic uh, focus. We do have a couple of uh, platform integration webinars coming up, definitely one coming up around sale points that I know you'll want to take a look at uh, and see how we can integrate with the leading uh, identity provisioning and governance solution on the marketplace and allow you to get even more out of your applications than you are today. Thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon and we look forward to seeing you the next time we come online.